Yes. Um, eventually, maybe 50 years from now, we'll turn over things to the uh, Iraqi and Afghani forces. Are you making any effort to develop some sort of program for them with, you know, using their own museum people and so forth? Um, are we making any effort to work with the museums in Iraq and Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis, um, more advanced cataloging systems and care for antiquities? Well, it was more like to train Iraqi troops to take over. Oh, to train Iraqi troops. troops. Yeah. Um, uh, you know. No, we haven't. Um, I mean, the issue of the Iraqi troops is a difficult one. When Donnie George was um, director of antiquities in Iraq, he worked very hard to train the um, soldiers who were patrolling the archaeological sites very, very hard. And um, he was pretty successful in doing it, given the limited resources at his disposal. If you go to the SAFE website, the Saving Antiquities for Everyone website, um, you can hear a nearly 40-minute interview with him about this. It's a podcast. Since he left the country, um, initially for Syria, and now, of course, he's visiting professor at SUNY Stony Brook. Um, the care given to instructing the soldiers on archaeological sites has not been as robust as it had been before. Um, I certainly want to do something about this. I haven't yet quite figured out how to do it, but it's something that we have to do, and so we will find a way to do it. Yes. I think everyone remembers Donald Rumsfeld, where Donald Rumsfeld's complaint about the media showing the same guy carrying the same pot out of the Antiquities Museum in Iraq. Um, what percentage of stuff that was taken out of that museum was restored by, by Gunners? It's hard What's for missing? us. It's hard for us to estimate um, or to know exactly how much was taken out and exactly how much has been restored. The initial estimates which were 170,000 were way off the mark. Virtually every um, object of importance stolen from the museum has now been repatriated. If you were to ask Matthew Bogdanos, who knows a lot more about these things than I do, he would say several thousand are still missing. But um, the repatriation effort, um, which again made good use of the imams, was remarkably successful. So a number of the pieces that had been stolen, the head of Sargon or um, the alabaster vase from Warka, those are, those are all back. Um, we'll never know for sure because not everything had a catalog card. So we'll never know exactly how much was taken out. But the majority of things have been returned. Yes? I remember when I, I saw your lecture recently in Portland, and, and you mentioned the Warka vase and how it was brought back. Can you tell everyone how they, how they brought it back? I think you mentioned someone drove up in a car and it was in their trunk or something. Yeah, when, um, I mean, Matthew Bogdanos really is the one to talk about how these things came back because he was the one who engineered it. But yes, a car simply came up with the work of Ace, opened the back, the, the box came out, it had the work of Ace. They shook, um, he went away, um, and the work of Ace was returned. There was a, another one where um, he met someone in a coffee shop. The man came in, gave him the antiquity, smiled, and left. And these repatriation efforts worked because there was an amnesty on the return. And so people were getting worried about what would happen to them if they kept the antiquities. And as the repatriation continued, it became clear that Matthew really was sincere in his offer of amnesty that no one would be prosecuted. And so things began coming back. Once people realized they could trust Matthew, then things were coming back at a relatively rapid rate. Yes, Laura. Yes, uh, one more question. Um, the, uh, a lot of the troops are now on their third or fourth rotation. Are you still talking to those same units? I mean, would it be repetitious for them, or do they have enough? So far, I haven't seen that it's repetitious for anyone. At least nobody's been falling asleep. Um, so I don't think we're hitting the same soldiers. I mean, there are so many soldiers that are going. 
and we don't do it every day, that I don't think it's repetitious for any of them. I should point out that I'm not the only one um, who does this. There's a, a good force of people who are going out to the bases, not just me, but a number of others. I, I've used in particular archaeologists who uh, served in the Vietnam War, um, in part because we as archaeologists get used to AIA lecture tours. And those are wonderful things. We're treated to elaborate dinners. People cater to our every need. We're given lovely hotels in which to stay. They're uh, as good as the best vaudeville ever could have been. Um, but these are not lecture tours of the AIA. These are very different. And so if one of the colonels says, you have to speak to a 1,000 soldiers in five minutes, you have to say, OK. You have to turn on a dime, and you can't mind it. Um, and I find that if I use archaeologists who have seen military service, they're better at turning on that dime than some others. But that's not to say that I haven't used others who haven't seen military service in Vietnam. I, I use a, a broad range, and, and both men and women. Yes? Are you reaching the National Guard troops at all, or strictly professional army? We're um, not reaching National Guard. You're right. We should do that. Um, we're only reaching Army and Marines. But it's a good suggestion that we go after the National Guard.